Greetings, everyone. I'm Larry Jamison, Dean of the Perlman School of Medicine. Welcome to the annual Basser Center for BRCA Breakthroughs and Discoveries panel. This is a really special event. It offers an insider's view of the amazing work of the Basser Center team, as well as the global BRCA scientific community and the progress they're making for patients and families affected by a BRCA mutation. It's all thanks to Mindy and John Gray, who created the Basser Center in 2012, following an untimely death of Mindy's sister, Faith. It's hard to believe that we celebrate the center's 10th anniversary this year. Mindy and John's vision has become their family's labor of love. Together, they have joined forces to create the Basser Center, which is now an international powerhouse of research, patient care, and educational outreach for BRCA-related cancers. Mindy's sister, Sherry, and her husband, Len Potter, created and endowed the Vassar Global Prize to recognize a leading scientist in BRCA research. We were honored this year to recognize Dr. Bella Kaufman of Sheba Medical Center in Israel. She was recognized yesterday with this award, a highlight of this two-day symposium attended by 500 scientists and care providers from around the world. Dr. Kaufman is a leading clinician and breast cancer researcher in BRCA genetics who has conducted many important clinical trials, including several essential to the development of PARP inhibitors for the treatment of BRCA-related cancers. The Basser Center is an essential component of our world-leading Abramson Cancer Center. Dr. Susan Donchak has served as the outstanding executive director of the Basser Center and as the Basser Professor of Oncology since the center's founding. The Abramson Cancer Center director, Dr. Bob Vonderheide, is leading our cancer program to new heights. Last year, the NCI once again rated ACC as exceptional, the highest possible rating for an NCI designated comprehensive cancer center, the third straight exceptional rating. Congratulations to the team. Also, he and his team are working on a preventative vaccine for BRCA related cancers. The next phase of this clinical trial is currently enrolling BRCA mutation carriers who have had cancer. In the fall, the team will begin enrolling mutation carriers who have not had cancer. That's really exciting. Through the pandemic, the Basser Center continued its research activities and they've made a number of important advances. For example, results from the International Olympia trial suggest that Limparza, an FDA approved PARP inhibitor, may be a promising treatment for women with BRCA related breast cancer. So much so that the trial is moving to early analysis and reporting. Dr. Domchek and Dr. Kate Nathanson, along with a collaborative multi-institutional study team, recently published a New England Journal of Medicine paper shedding new light on breast cancer risk for women in the general population. This important study showed that some mutations do not increase one's risk for cancer as much as previously thought, which will better inform risk assessment for individuals and their families. The past year has challenged us in so many ways. I'm incredibly proud of our community, including the Basser Center for stepping up and taking the lead. A vital part of the Basser mission is education and guidance. Pre-COVID, the Basser team was providing genetic counseling via telehealth. When COVID hit, they were ready to offer this invaluable service to patients everywhere. In fact, their flexibility expanded Basser's reach 25% more patients received genetic counseling in 2020 than in 2019. The Basser Center is also focused on increasing access for underrepresented communities and reaching out to all patients through programs such as Latinx and BRCA, Black and BRCA, and a new summer internship for minority undergraduates interested in pursuing a genetics related career. The Basser Center is a model of excellence in Penn Medicine's efforts to improve health equity. In addition to our remarkable Basser Center leadership, researchers and care teams, we remain enormously grateful to Mindy and John Gray for their generosity and their partnership in seeking an end to BRCA related cancers. I'm delighted to introduce them now. Mindy and John, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Thank you Dean Jamison for the introduction. I wish we were together today, crammed into a room, shoulder to shoulder with all of you. But thankfully, we were able to meet virtually to celebrate the gift of research and clinical care. 
If ever a year taught us the power of science, it is this one. We have Penn researchers, Drs. Drew Weissman and Caddy Carrico, to thank for the mRNA technology that led to the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which are bringing us back together in mass-free togetherness. Next year, I like to say, in Philadelphia. This symposium is a highlight of my year, marked by bursting May blooms and emerging discoveries from leaders in the global field of research and clinical care. We are firm believers in collaboration, so nothing makes us happier than the buzz of sharing that happens when all of you come together, even virtually, to discuss BRCA. Our entry into this world began in a place of deep, deep sadness. I lost my sister, Faith Basser, to BRCA-related ovarian cancer when she was just 44 years old. The older I get, the younger that sounds. It never gets easier to talk about. My nephew was only four when he lost his mommy. And I can tell you, no one should have to watch someone they love ravaged by this disease. It is brutal and unforgiving. Faith's death fueled us to create the center, but it is the leadership of Penn Medicine with Dean Jamison, Kevin Mahoney, John Epstein and Bob Vonderheide, Annette Basser with John, Ronnie Drapkin, Roger Greenberg, Kate Nathanson, Beth Stearman, and our incomparable executive director, Dr. Susan Domchek, that inspires us each and every day. Yesterday's tribute to our 2021 Global Prize Award recipient, Bella Kaufman of Israel Sheba Medical Center was moving and impactful. Dr. Kaufman has devoted her life to the clinical care and research of BRCA related breast cancer and her role as career trailblazer, feminist, mentor and mother came through an emotional focus. She herself is now battling breast cancer. So along with eternal gratitude, I say a special prayer for her today. Lefua Shalema, Dr. Kaufman. This is why we are here. We believe in all of you and know the more that you can share your ideas and fund your vision, the faster we can get to a world where families don't lose beloved sisters and brilliant scientists before their time. In addition to collaborative research and clinical care, Vassar is focused on awareness. In my first generation family, we simply had no written or oral history, so there was no warning that my sister was at risk. Faith paid the ultimate price, but no one else should have to. It is estimated that 1 million Americans have a BRCA mutation, but only 10% know they are BRCA positive. This is unacceptable. On April 26, we launched a new marketing campaign centered around the theme of Do You Have It?, which directs people to our bassar.org website to take a, take a quiz and seek genetic counseling as needed. We hope that you will visit our site, take the quiz, and share it with family and friends. A link will be sent out after, with a survey after today's panel. Our Bassar Young Leadership Council and Parent Leadership Community offer support and knowledge about dealing with mutations in every stage of life. Please connect with us if you'd like to be a part of either of these communities. We are also focused on reducing racial health disparities, particularly in genetic counseling and testing. There are only 5,000 genetic counselors in the country, way too few for rising demand. And even more astounding is that only 50 of them are black. We at Bassar know that this statistic is unacceptable and are working to address and repair this inequity. Through our Latinx and BRCA and black and BRCA initiatives, we're working to extend our reach to communities that are often overlooked, ensuring that they can make informed decisions about their health to protect themselves and their families. I am grateful for our panelists, Dr. Kathleen Moore and Dr. Kim Rice Bender for sharing their expertise. I never tire of learning, even when the science sometimes soars way over my head. And finally, 
We lost a beloved member of the Vassar Center family last month. Steve Price was a deep thinker who cherished these gatherings, listening, learning, and actually understanding every aspect of the science. He burrowed into the facts, challenged suppositions, hypothesized, synthesized, and strategized. He had a deep intellect and an even deeper heart. And his strength in tackling pancreatic cancer charged researchers to power on. Steve's memory will stay alive in your research and breakthroughs. And we will be dedicating the 2022 symposium to his life and love. Before I pass the screen over to my husband, I end with Dr. Bella Kaufman's words, nothing but nothing happens without Susan Domchak. We couldn't agree more. Amen, I'm Susan Domchak. Uh, she is a change agent and a true force for good. She's a brilliant scientist and a compassionate doctor, which is a powerful combination. And most of all, she will not accept the status quo as it relates to BRCA. She has a lot of chutzpah, as Dr. Kaufman said yesterday, even if she isn't Jewish. And we are blessed to have her as our leader. So thank you, Susan. A few more thank yous from me. Thanks to the entire Basser team at Penn Medicine. You have an amazing sense of purpose and amazing commitment. I wanna thank my incredible wife, for her vision and drive, which push all of us to achieve our best around BRCA and beyond. As Dr. Jameson said and Mindy said, thanks to our partners on this mission, Len and Sherry Potter, who bestowed the Basser Global Prize yesterday in that moving session to Dr. Kaufman, it was powerful. I wanna thank everyone here for listening in and participating in this symposium. It is so important to bring together researchers, clinicians, genetic counselors, and affected families from around the world. The Bassler Center was designed to be the central hub for all things BRCA. And the last two days have certainly been all about that. We know for almost all of you listening in that BRCA issues are deeply personal. You've, you've devoted your careers to this effort or it affects your families directly. The loss of Steve Price was another painful reminder, as Mindy articulated, very painful. And we all know we have to do better, we have to go faster. In particular to me, the options for women just don't work. Prophylactic double mastectomies and oophorectomies are not acceptable choices and we've got to do better. The good news is that we are making enormous progress on multiple fronts since we started the Basser Center nearly a decade ago. In terms of awareness, that's up sharply and importantly, so is access to testing, which is saving lives. In terms of treatment, these PARP inhibitors, which you hear so much about, are now life-saving options targeted specifically for BRCA-related breast, ovarian, pancreatic, and prostate cancers. In terms of early detection, we are now building a pre-cancer atlas at Basser in partnership with other institutions to understand the development of these cancers. It's like exploring volcanoes prior to the eruptions. It's gonna to lead to better decisions on who should do prophylactic surgeries and when they should do them, and ultimately how to stop them from developing. We're also focusing on the fallopian tubes, which give us better targeted options, hopefully for women, if we can determine that it's in the tubes where these ovarian cancers start. If we can take out the tubes, we can avoid early menopause. And in terms of cure, our great hope the first trials have now started for a vaccine, but of course, it is very early days. Basser is also investing in the next generation of leaders through the Pearl and Phil Basser Innovation Award, named after Mindy and Sherry's parents. I am proud to report that Phil Basser is doing well at 103 years old, rooting for the Phillies and the Eagles, and hopefully watching us today. 
The 2021 Innovation Award goes to Penn Medicine's Dr. Ashley Haggerty, an assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology. Her research focuses on improving treatment and care for BRCA-related ovarian cancer patients. We are hugely indebted to the efforts of Dr. Haggerty and her colleagues for their commitment and creativity they bring to this vital cause. The progress is tangible, but these doctors need our help and scientists. Mindy and I have contributed now over $100 million to the BRCA-related effort, most of it here at Basser. We are all in, but we need even more help in this fight against long-term, multi-generational BRCA-related cancers. Please help us join the fight, support Basser and these heroic scientists. Their cause is so important and the impact so enormous. Thank you for listening in. And with that, I will turn things over to our friend, our leader, Susan Domchek. Thank you so much, uh, John and Mindy. It has just been an incredible partnership that we have had um, and uh, we are determined to do better. And we will uh, because of your efforts. Thanks to, to Len and Sherry as well and the whole Basser community. I mean, it really takes a village and I'm thrilled uh, to uh, present to you today um, what we've been up to. So thanks again. I'm going to introduce now Dr. Kim Rice Bender. And she is an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania and Dr. Kathleen Moore, who's a professor at the University of Oklahoma. And we're thrilled to have you both here with us today. And we're gonna start off our panel discussion. We have had already a ton of questions. <laughs> they have come in both in advance and um, uh, as we're speaking. One is that I'm gonna just get started because a number of people have asked this. When do I recommend that individuals get testing for BRCA1 and 2? Our sh short answer for this is that for women, we start breast MRI screening in general at age 25. Uh, there are some exceptions when there's exceptionally young cancer in the family, but in general, the risk of developing breast cancer for core age uh, 30 in BRCA1 and 2 carriers is about 5%. And so we generally uh, do testing at age 25. Uh, for that reason, that's when we start medical management. For men, we don't start medical management until later ages, more like uh, 40 when we talk about PSA screening and potentially mammograms uh, and uh, things like that. But some men and women choose to get testing, genetic testing earlier because they're interested in something called pre-implantation genetic testing, which is when a couple can go through in vitro fertilization, screen the embryos, and only re-implant the embryos that don't have BRCA1 and 2 mutations. And as you can imagine, these are extremely personal decisions. But if a young man at 28 is ready to start having his family and is interested in this, that is a time at which they can consider testing. We will also uh, obviously uh, talk to ha talk to anyone who um, has uh, who's over 18 about this. Um, there, uh, just for the the technical people, some people are commenting that the audio is cutting in and out. So I'm sure you're working on that, but just as something else has come up. Now I'm going to divide this into a couple of sections. So we're first going to talk about risk, and then prevention, and then treatment. I'm going to try to incorporate all of your questions along the way. My first question is for Dr. Moore. What are risk factors for ovarian cancer? And can you tell us the difference between BRCA1 and 2 when you're thinking about ovarian cancer? Sure. So risks for ovarian cancer, so from the genetic standpoint, of course, is uh, BRCA1 and 2. Uh, there's other high penetrance but low frequency genes that we're increasingly identifying as we're doing more panel testing across the board for 100% of our patients who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So we are identifying some additional genes that are likely important and do place patients at risk. How high that risk is um, and the penetrance among families, we're still really learning as we test and follow more families. And so it's hard to sort of give a risk estimate for things like PALB2, CHECK1, BRIP1, RAD51C, et cetera. So, so I think there's still a lot to learn from a genetic standpoint from a um, what we call an epidemiologic standpoint, like other risk factors, they're kind of hard to define. You know, um, infertility uh, or nulliparity have been associated with uh, or increased risk of ovarian cancer, not infertility treatments. That's a uh, myth. 
Um, it's not the treatments, but sort of something about being infertile, some aspect potentially in the fallopian tube. We don't really know the prime cause, but there is an association uh, that we do see with development of ovarian cancer, family history apart from uh, a genetic predisposition. And I know that's true in breast as well, where sometimes families are just rife with diagnoses and we just can't find a cause. We see that less frequently, but we do see that in ovarian cancer and we pay attention and, and um, modify our kind of uh, counseling for families accordingly. Um, and then there's all the other sort of loose associations with obesity and other lifestyle choices. Um, the talc stuff is nonsense, but I won't get into that. Um, it makes me angry. It's um, not true. Um, but anyway, <laughs> but birth control and birth control pills decrease. are protective. Yeah. You know, so at least five years of use. And, and then tell us about sort of lifetime risk of BRCA1 versus BRCA2, because they are, as we say, associated, but different cancers. Right. So BRCA1, you know, we uh, are really the cancers that we see in younger patients. So the average age of diagnosis for in general is right around um, 58. Um, we see cancers in the late 40s, early 50s in our patients with BRCA1. BRCA2, really the diagnosis is close to the baseline kind of background risk, which is why with good genetic counseling, you can actually delay those risk-reducing surgeries that I know are, um, you know, it's early castration really for women. It's not great, but it is what we can do right now, but you can delay it in BRCA2. In right. BRCA1, we really want um, tubes and ovaries right now, the, um, uh, salpingectomy alone is still experimental, though we hope it will be a uh, standard of care. Really want those out at uh, conclusion of childbearing, but by, I mean, I usually say 40, I have two experts on the panel with me who can, we can fight about it, but we really like them out. Um, makes us nervous. Um, after 40 bracket two, we can wait close even to menopause, but 45 is our kind of our usual rate. The risk of ovarian cancer for BRCA2 is less than BRCA1. Um, so it's a, it's a lower risk in the 30% range, um, higher for, for BRCA1, but still much too high to ever leave the organs in, in situ. So we, will, we don't adjust our counseling regarding risk-reducing surgery based on the differential risk um, of the two genes. Just too high risk. It's really, it's really all about timing. Yeah. So that's, yeah. yeah. And then Kim, take us through pancreatic cancer for risk for BRCA1 versus 2. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting listening to, to Kathleen talk. It's interesting how we have different, how, how it's so different from, from different perspectives of different illnesses. So, so pancreas, BRCA2, um, if we're talking about those two specific genes, carries a, a substantially higher risk for pancreatic cancer um, uh, with a lifetime risk somewhere between probably five and five and eight percent or five and ten percent, whereas the risk for pancreatic cancer in someone with BRCA1 um, is much lower, one to five percent. And in terms of um, of counseling patients, some you know in clinic, you know, when I meet these patients who are, have a, a pancreas cancer and in terms of counseling their families, one of the things that I emphasize is that this is not male or female because BRCA1 and 2 are often considered the breast and ovarian cancer genes and people think only need to be tested if I'm a woman. And, and that's, you know, not, not the case, prostate and pancreas cancer, melanoma, um, and breast cancer, male breast cancer are, are risks for the men as well. So I make sure I counsel everybody to get testing no matter their, their sex. Um, in terms of risk reduction, um, Dr. Moore was talking about risk reduction surgeries. We don't do that yet. Uh, don't do that in pancreas cancer. The risk Ooh. is low. I know. Wouldn't that be terrible? Be so risk, terrible. Right. I mean, the, losing your pancreas. I mean, I think losing your ovaries and your fluid. No, no, you know, there's no, no saying that that's not severe and that's not, you know, like you said, it's early castration for women, which really brings it home and makes it stark. Um, but living without a pancreas is no picnic either. So we do recommend screening. Um, there are guidelines now about screening for pancreas cancer, and there are also trials where, where screening is being done, including a trial called CAPS-5, where um, an endoscopy is done, and then some of that fluid from, from any from pancreatic fluid is actually captured to see if we can look for early, um, uh, early, early mutations, basically early signs that there may be something amiss. But, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you on a couple of things. Uh, my, sure. our, our questioners are good. Well, we need to, they want to know what are the lifetime risks of pancreatic cancer for BRCA1 versus BRCA2? What are the absolute risks? 
what like what what percent chance do they have of having a Correct. getting it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and I'm happy to sort of uh, jump in there too. I mean, general, you can, sure. Go yeah, ahead. In general, for BRCA one, you know, we talk about a two to three percent lifetime risk, where the baseline's one to two percent. So you can see that the absolute risk isn't high. It's just a bad disease. For BRCA two, we talk about more like five to seven percent lifetime risk. Um, and so one of the challenges that we've had with screening, uh, you know, uh, Kim, you mentioned NCCN now and others do recommend pancreatic cancer screening in the setting of a BRCA1 or 2 mutation when you have a first degree relative with pancreatic cancer. Right. And so I think that what we don't know is whether everybody should get in. So that's, you know, a, a lot of the ongoing studies will will help answer. Well, and, it's, and it's really interesting how you have, a you know, clearly these variants are different in their behavior, right? You'll have a family that has BRCA2 and there are many, there are three, four people with pancreatic cancer and then another family with BRCA2. I'm sure, you, I mean, you guys, this is not, you know, and then, and everybody's got breast cancer. Like, it's a really interesting how it's. Yeah, we, we don't entirely understand that, that yet, but it would be nice to figure it out. Uh, this was, this, uh, you know, to, to complete sort of the, 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 because several people have asked this, well, what is the spectrum of cancers? So BRCA1, breast, ovarian, and a little bit of, and then this pancreatic cancer risk. The prostate cancer risk is actually complicated right. in BRCA1. Uh, it may be elevated, but it's not nearly like BRCA2. Right. So for, for BRCA2, lifetime risk of breast cancer, 50 to 70%, ovarian cancer, 10 to 20%. Uh, pancreatic cancer, you know, in that five to 7% range, male breast cancer is more with BRCA2 than BRCA1. So the male breast cancer risk is, you know, again, five to 7% for BRCA2, 1% for BRCA1. And again, prostate cancer risk, BRCA2 much higher, definitely greater than 25% and a more aggressive kind of prostate cancer. Some, uh, there's been a specific question about colon cancer. There was this whole thing about colon cancer, and I'll just put it this way, that the summary of the evidence does not suggest an increased risk of colon cancer with BRCA1. Now, having said that, in the general population, the screening age has decreased now from 50 to 45 for most guidelines. So that's, if you will, if there is some slight increased risk, that guideline change to 45 should mostly take care of it. Uh, so that's sort of important. And I mean, in terms of, you know, other risk factors, Kim, just for pancreatic cancer, there are, are other risk factors in the yeah. general population. Can you review those? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. There are several risk factors that are, that are known to be associated with it, with pancreatic cancer. Smoking is, is one. That's a, that's a big one. Obesity uh, is considered a risk factor. Sedentary lifestyle is considered a risk factor. Uh, chronic alcohol use or chronic pancreatitis is a um, is a risk factor because of chronic inflammation, presumably in the pancreas. And there is also a genomic syndrome um, that is associated with that. There's a pancreatitis syndrome um, that then has an associated increased risk. Um, we, uh, you know, we some of these things are, you know, a lot of some of the things I mentioned are are, are modifiable. Some of them are not. Um, and so we counsel patients, uh, accordingly. Um, that's, that's great. That's so helpful. And now I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more about early detection. We, thank you, Kim, you've mentioned already, uh, you know, Dr. Moore, um, at ovarian cancer screening, discuss. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of work. Um, and actually, I don't know how much I can say, cause I know some of what's going on at your site. Um, and Johns Hopkins. So, so lots of work has been done. There's been tremendous work in screening. Um, there's something called the UK Fox study that was hundreds of thousands of women of, of general risk, not high risk, who underwent the CA125 serial testing algorithm with referral to ultrasound, really trying to keep a better eye on the population in general. And it did catch tumors earlier, but it didn't catch early tumors. It did it. So the purpose of screening is to catch things before they're cancers or at a state when you can cure them and keep them from becoming kind of terminal cancers. And it did not do that. Um, it just caught advanced stage cancers a few months early, which is good, but probably not worth the hundreds of thousands of women who underwent unnecessary testing. Screening for high, no, women with known high risk um, genetic predisposition or family predisposition has been somewhat controversial, although we do it. So we do CA125s, we do the ultrasounds, we keep very close eye on patients who don't want their um, organs removed. 
Uh, that, of course, is the kind of the biggest intervention that we can do. And I can tell you, I've done that and had a completely normal CA125 and ultrasound. And within six months, it was stage three, you know, massive debulking just right in front of my eyes, uh, which is incredibly frustrating. So the screening right now is um, not good. There's a lot of really exciting work happening right now, um, trying to look at a TP53 signature that you may be able to get off a pap test. And it's so funny because women always ask me, my patients like, why wasn't this caught on my pap test? And we're like, well, because that's a cervix cancer screen, but maybe it can be an ovary screen. We'll see trying to identify um, the TP53 gene mutations that are basically ubiquitous with high-grade serous ovarian cancer, not all, and then trigger um, a a more workup kind of earlier on. So that's early days, uh, but there are clinical trials that are running now. And um, I think of the screening potentials, that's the one that to me has the most um, feasibility behind it. You know, the other things we've tried is like sampling the tubes, like sticking a tube up the fallopian tubes. Like that's not an, if you don't like colonoscopy, you don't want a brush stuck up your fallopian tube. Um, so, so I think that probably has the most like uh, feasible screening written all over it. Um, but it's early days. Right. And the other thing that's out there is of course, you know, this liquid biopsy for early detection. So Kim, uh, Dr. Rice Bender, I'm sorry. I just know you personally. So I'm being in <laughs> apologies. Um, tell us what a liquid biopsy is and tell us, you know, do you think it might help? And we'll all discuss that. We'll see. We'll see. Right. So a liquid, so a liquid biopsy is a blood test. It's not a tissue test. It is a test of the blood. And what it is looking for is circulating tumor DNA or circulating tumor material that may be, um, uh, an early sign of cancer. So Dr. Moore mentioned the TP53 mutation. That seems to be an early cancer driver mutation. So for example, if you were detect to detect something like that in the bloodstream, um, you might start looking for, um, for a malignancy somewhere in that person. Um, it's not too different than the tests we do now to detect um, genomic variations in babies and fetuses when a woman is pregnant because cancer cells, just like fetal cells, shed, die and shed their DNA into the bloodstream. And so we can capture pieces of that and look. It is a huge area of interest to try to use these types of tests, I think, for capturing, um, for, for identifying theoretically or hopefully patients at an earlier state of disease <clears throat> than, than uh, you know, to, to be able to catch it early when you might not see it on another type of test. I think, um, I think early, 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 early days, and especially in terms of pancreas cancer, I think, you know, for um, there is a, a movement within the cooperative groups now um, to do studies in this space. And, and you need an enormous number of people, um, especially for a disease that, that thankfully, even with a genomic mutation is not going to affect the majority of the patients who carry that alteration. And so, you need a large number of patients and you need a large period of time to follow those patients and make sure that you really are making a difference. But I think that there is an enormous amount of interest in this space in trying to, in trying to, uh, to use those tests as a way, as an extra way to screen. And I'm very interested to see, you know, what happens, but again, early, early, early for that. Yeah. I think that first of all, some of these companies may launch their commercial tests on the basis of what they have so far. And I just urge everyone to kind of just just be careful about what what they they can show uh, a lot of these tests you know can detect cancers but they detect cancers when we've detected the cancer so the key is that these tests have to detect cancer before we can find them so for instance you know a stage one breast cancers they're not great these tests so far and again they, they'll get better aren't great at detecting them and so and also you know if you're older, you can have false positives because just there's, you know, right. blood cells actually start to accumulate mutations over time. And we know that. So we have to be super careful about, you know, false positives and not over reliance because some of our tests like MRI screening for breast cancer is actually very good. And so we're not necessarily doing better for stage one breast cancer, but pancreatic cancer is hard. Ovarian cancer is hard. Right. Could these could these tests add value? We certainly hope for it. So, but as Dr. Moore may review, 
we've been here with ovarian cancer before. We had Ovacheck, Overshore, I don't know, Ovalon. I can't remember how many. That was going to be the answer to early detection of ovarian cancer. And in prospective trials, didn't pan out. Because that's what you need. You need prospective trials. Do we find this earlier or can we just detect the cancer at the time it's there? So I don't know if you wanted to make a further comment, Dr. Moore. No, I mean, I think that that summarizes it. We really want to prevent ovarian cancer. Like I would be so happy to just lay down my sword and retire now. And I think someone talked about planting things in spring earlier. That's like my, that's what I'm going to do. I'm happy to do that. Happy, happy, happy. But we're just not there. Um, we're just not there. The best we can do right now is, is get everyone tested for BRCA. That's been our our huge hurdle to actually get everyone tested and now do catch up testing. It's sort of the halo effect of PARP inhibitors is that it really demanded initially that you knew. And so now everyone's getting tested and then cascade test all of the relative, at least offer cascade testing that everyone wants to be tested so that we can have previvors, but it does require these invasive procedures. Um, but until we can, can screen, we can prevent for the most part. Um, so that's kind of where we are now, but I do think there's some exciting yeah. tests, whether or not they pan out, I don't know, but it's certainly going to be better than CA-125 and referral to ultrasound that does not work. Right. And, and again, we're very excited about these tests. We just, you know, we're scientists, so we have to sort of say, okay, what does it exactly do? What doesn't it do? Where does it work? Where, where is it problematic? Um, and no test is perfect, but mm-hmm. we can certainly yeah, do that. I'll say actually just to add really quick, I mean, with pancreas, it, it's a very low shedding tumor anyway, in addition. So we sometimes have patients, and again, this is about the test needing to be developed in a more stringent way. And they, and that will happen with time, but sometimes even with patients now who have a diagnosis of pancreas cancer, we don't detect, um, circulating mutations. It's really interesting. It's a very hypocellular low shedding tumor. So in low burden States, are you, you're really going to have a, need a very, very good test to be able to identify it early. And the technologies that are occurring are amazing. And we're, yeah. you know, we have a very big biobank at Vassar. We're collaborating with a lot of these groups that are, have new technologies to the fore. So, you know, we hope we have a different answer for you in a, in a year or two. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to do a couple of quick ones, by the way, if I'm looking off to the side, it's because I'm reading all your amazing questions. So this one's quick because if a man is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in his early sixties, no family history of breast and ovarian cancer, should he and his daughters be tested for BRC1 and 2? Kim, should pancreatic cancers be tested for BRC1 and 2? <laughs> the patient should be tested. Absolutely. That is nationally guideline driven. The patient should be tested for a genetic alteration. We know now that if we only use clinical cues like family history, the ones that, that Susan mentioned, that we will miss people. So yes, testing is absolutely indicated. If the patient passes away prior to testing, then it is indicated for his children to be tested, daughters and sons. So I'm, I'm going to, because this question was asked a lot, I'm going to have a few things. There are some really easy ones. All ovarian cancer patients need genetic testing. All pancreatic cancer patients. All metastatic prostate cancer patients. Um, all triple negative breast cancer patients. When you start to get into breast cancer patients in 80-year-olds with no family history, it gets more complicated. But those, those big statements that I just made, all male breast cancer patients, these are easy and we are missing these people. Yeah. I mean, it is amazing how many people with ovarian cancer in the general population don't get tested. For Absolutely. And as a reminder, if people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent have a higher risk of having BRCA1 or two mutations, 2.5% of people who are of Ashkenazi Jewish descent have a BRCA1 or two mutation. BRCA1 and 2 mutations are seen in every race. They're seen in every ethnicity. So just because you're not of Ashkenazi Jewish descent does not mean you should not get testing. And so I think we can all tell you, we really are striving to have more of the appropriate people testing and then their relatives, because once you have that information, you can make such an impact on their relatives. Now, Dr. Moore, back to you. Lots of questions about salpingectomy, can I take HRT? So why don't we, and primary peritoneal cancer after your, your ovaries are out. So yeah. let's see, we'll start, start with any one of them. So salpingectomy, I think is, um, there are several clinical trials that um, are either completed accrual or close. The biggest one, one of the biggest ones, Dr. Karen Liu at MD Anderson has run. Um, and I don't know if she's done accrual, it was very close. And, but then you have to follow patients for a long time. 
Um, and so, so that's where we are right now to really show that it's safe. So it's sort of a, it doesn't mean you don't necessarily have to have your ovaries out, but it sort of sequences you. So the fallopian tubes can come out and we get you closer to natural menopause before we take the ovaries out. No one is super comfortable yet about leaving those organs in situ. Maybe someday when we understand this all better, we will, but it's not just the tubes. It's the tubes for now. And then later we get the ovaries. Um, I would not say that is standard of care yet, although I wish I could say that. Um, there's early studies, small, that would suggest it is safe, um, but we cannot say that it entirely um, prevents the ovarian cancer because we're not entirely convinced that it's 100% all the fallopian tube. Um, so I think that's one of the next big questions, but it really needs to be done on clinical trial um, in my opinion, it, it, I would not say the standard of care yet, but I hope it soon will be. Um, yeah. And I want to jump. Example. I want to jump in there to follow up on something that you said before because I think it's really important. What I'm seeing is people who are told that they need their ovaries out kind of earlier than they really need to, and so I think that sometimes we really need to have a better conversation about this. You know, the NCCN guidelines say for BRCA one ages 35 to 40, for BRCA two 40 to 45. When you look at the data, the risk of developing ovarian cancer prior to age 35 in a BRCA, you know, or prior to age 40 in a BRCA1 care is around 3%. Right. So we have, have an informed decision with people about that. But if for BRCA2, the risk is actually quite low before age 45. It's never zero because medicine, unfortunately, doesn't work that way. But if we can get people to 45, that, that feels very different. Right. And, and then sometimes I have people come in and they've been recommended at 30 to have their ovaries out. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You know, the risk is so low at your age and the, and the, the downsides of early menopause are significant. So talk about HRT, because that's, I think, another big, big issue. Right. So HRT has been studied um, and there are, um, in ovarian cancer, it's not, it's not felt to be contraindicated. Like I, I do try non-hormonal things just because there's other risks um, associated with HRT, but I'm not, I mean, I have patients who just are suffering. And I use HRT. Um, right. it, there's no data that HRT either causes ovarian cancer or causes recurrences. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have a, a negative impact and it's better for your bone health. The one caveat I will say is I'm talking about high grade epithelial ovarian cancer. There are a subset, and some of you may be listening, that are low grade ovarian cancer, which is about 10% of epithelial ovarian cancer. It's a completely different molecular pathway as to how these tumors develop their pre-malignant um, lesion is entirely different. It's not a stick lesion in the fallopian tube. It may be a borderline tumor. Those can be estrogen driven. Um, and we actually routinely test, we treat them kind of like breast cancers. Actually, we do lots of hormonal blockade and lots of targeted things because chemo doesn't work especially well. Um, but I don't do replacement there. Um, and by the way, HRT is hormone replacement therapy. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't use it there um, if at all possible. And that really stinks because these are, tr these are really young women <laughs> and yeah. they really suffer. But, um, you know, when I'm using letrozole as a treatment, I can't justify giving them estrogen back unless I'm giving a little add back with some progestin in a patient whose really quality of life is deteriorating. So that's different. So I just wanted to make that caveat, but high grade serous, um, we use, it's just, yeah, the number of women who are just denied things inappropriately is staggering. So, and, and from a breast cancer perspective, you know, just to, so there's two, there's a series of questions, by the way, your questions are awesome. Uh, and one is if you take your ovaries out, do you decrease breast cancer risk? This has actually been a little bit you know, we had a study in 2010 that said yes, and then there was a study that said maybe not, and then there was a study that said yes for BRC2 and one that said BRC1. My summary of all the evidence is that yes, it does a little bit, but that's not, you know, the major reason you have your ovaries out. The major reason you take your ovaries out is so you don't get ovarian cancer. And there may be this added value of uh, 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 decreasing, uh, yes, someone made a really good point, a uh, decreasing um, uh that you don't mostly take your ovaries out to decrease breast cancer risk, uh, but that it may have that additional effect. Adding hormone replacement therapy back, um, this is a complicated discussion regarding breast cancer risk. However, in general, you were making estrogen before we took your ovaries out, and then we give you a little bit back. So it's really different than sort of taking a woman who 
uh, who's had her no, uh, whole natural life of estrogen and giving her more. This is someone who has gotten less estrogen and we give them some back. Right. So again, very de- a nuanced discussion. Great point that people have talked about, about lifetime risk versus decade specific risk. It is true. We use decade specific risk and it's a really valuable point. If I have a 25 year old sitting in front of me, I don't talk about, you know, I say that there may be a 57 lifetime risk of breast cancer, but in the next five years, the risk is less than 5%. So you have to put it into context. When people are trying to make their decisions, you have to say, this is generally what we're talking about, but this is the risk in the short and, and long term. So, so many questions. I'm going to keep rapid firing. Kim, what are the, how do people know they have pancreatic cancer? Uh, that's well, that's that they don't. I think that's, that's a big part of the problem, right? So pancreas cancer, I think much like ovarian cancer is very sneaky um, in terms of its symptoms. It can be very vague. People will sometimes be walking around for months with vague abdominal pain or vague back pain or vague bloating and and have a workup by their primary or by a GI physician that that ultimately and ultimately end up with a CT and are then diagnosed. But there are a couple of telltale things that that you should pay attention to and that should really raise your antenna. Um, You know, uh, the back pain and the the abdominal pain can be in in the middle of the stomach and then to the back kind of around under the breast area, kind of all the way around. Um, and that's, and that's relatively nonspecific, but if that's persistent and it's specifically wrapping around, that's something to pay attention to worsening or new diabetes is something that needs to be paid attention to. I've had patients diagnosed because their endocrinologist noticed that their A1C sum, but suddenly jumped five points with no other obvious reason. The pancreas makes insulin. And so when the pancreas is compromised a little bit or a lot, the, the insulin production obviously slows down, um, Oil, another another really red flag is oily diarrhea. This is, I know, sorry to get graphic. I know that's really fun to talk about, but, um, you know, really loose stool with an oily film or with floating stool with oil in it. The pancreas is also responsible for making enzymes that break down fat. And so if you eat fat and your pancreas isn't working, the fat actually works as a bit of a laxative and, and can cause that. So that is a red flag. That's not, a, that's different than IBS or, you know, some other kind of digestive complaint. And then some people present with, with, with what we call jaundice or scleral ictris where the, the skin turns a different color, turns kind of yellowish and the eyes are yellow. Um, that is actually, that's the one way I think we all learned in medical school, painless jaundice as a presenting symptom. It's actually not the most common way that people present. Um, and then the final is, 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 you know, what we learn is red flags, weight, persistent weight loss. That's, that's un, otherwise unexplained. So if you have um, digestive complaints or pain that isn't going away um, or any of these other things are happening to you, this, that's the time to see somebody. Absolutely. I mean, my general rule, and again, you know, Dr. Moore, you can comment, but, you know, ovarian cancer, we often, you know, it's now it's uh, called, you know, the cancer that whispers. People do have symptoms. They're just rather vague. Exactly. And so, you know, oftentimes I'm telling people, listen, you know, if you've got symptoms for more than a few weeks without getting better, and this is new for you, you should get it worked up. I think that, you know, even you now as we get older, you know, we have increased cancer risk. And, and so that's ovarian cancer, you know, is tough because it's, it's bloating, it's abdominal pain. Um, but again, it's persistent. So it's not eating the bad burrito. It's persistent <laughs> symptoms for a few weeks, um, but that are worth uh, uh, working out. Dr. Right. Moore? Yeah, that's exactly it. It's, um, it's, I, I hate that it used to be called the silent killer or whatever. It's not silent at all. It's just, um, you know, a lot of times women are just either they're busy and they don't complain a lot, which is true. And they kind of just suffer through until they can't anymore, or they're kind of blown off. And yeah, it's, I see a lot of that yeah. or they get taken to the OR to get their gallbladders out. Cause that's clearly what it is. And no one's ever done a public well, exam right. and then they find it. Yeah. So. So we need to, so we need to just, you know, that doesn't mean that every symptom is cancer, but it's just persistent symptoms more than two weeks. Have a think about it. You know, uh, talk to your doctor. So, so many great questions. I want to get to prevention because prevention is important. We've talked about surgical prevention. And I just want to make a point that at the Bassler Center, we are determined that we have other prevention options. Um, you know, again, this is about options. You know, mastectomy can be right for some people and sort of not the right for the, uh, other people. And we just want to uh, present to people like, okay, these are different options that you can do. Uh, so we do have um, a vaccine trial that we just started. Uh, it was delayed due to the to the pandemic, but we have gotten going um, and starting with BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers who had uh, a sort of early stage cancer. We've just, you know, vaccinated our first patient last week. We will go into unaffected carriers. I have a few people who are interested in that. Feel free to check our website. There's a way to contact us. We're happy to talk to you more about that. 
We also will be starting a study uh, using a drug called denosumab, which is a, a bone strengthener medication, yeah. which may have the potential to decrease BRCA1 related breast cancers. And so keep an eye on it. We are determined to have these types of study prevention trials are hard to do and they take a long time, but they're worth it. And so we are going to uh, continue to, to move forward in that space. I want to go to treatment now because obviously the two of you, this has been such a, a key thing. I had a one specific question that I'm going to put to you, Dr. Moore, which is the risk of leukemia and the various studies. And they, uh, the specific question was solo two seemed to have a much higher leukemia risk. So comments on that. Yeah, it did. So, um, so of course, uh, you know, treatment related, we call them treatment related myeloid neoplasms. It's a broad swath of disorders. Typically we say, we kind of categorize them as myelodysplastic syndrome, high and low risk, and then um, AML, acute myelogenous leukemia, and we group them together, which probably we should. Um, in the frontline studies, the risk uh, looks to be about one to 2%, and that's for solo one has the longest follow-up. It's still holding at one to 2%, 1.5% with five years of follow-up. Solo two, uh, all BRCA-associated cancers, uh, has the longest follow-up again. And when they first presented their primary analysis, it was 4% and 4% in each arm, placebo and, and uh, olaparib, with the uh, cases in the placebo arm coming in the post, what we call the post-safety follow-up period. So after the patients come off study for at least 30 days, they were all diagnosed later. All the cases for the olaparib were on study. In the post treatment follow-up period, once the study was concluded or in the patients who are longer term follow-up, there was an additional number of cases identified. So it went to 8%. And, and this is troubling. It's still low. And we do see, oh, it's barely statistically kind of not significant, significant. There's an overall survival advantage there of a year. Um, and it's consistent with the NOVA study in that same population. So I think it's real, but there is this risk. And we're really sorting it out right now. I'd be interested in what my colleagues think. You know, I think when we first saw that and heard that it was post-treatment, we all thought, well, gosh, that's kind of what happens. Patients live longer. They get more platinum. And there's definitely association with treatment-related myeloid neoplasms and a lot of things. But platinum and the increasing use of platinum is associated with a bump. And so we thought, well, it's just what you see is women are living longer and they're getting more stuff and they're getting these secondary um, neoplasms. Um, but I actually just had the opportunity to write an editorial about this and, and looked at the supplement for Solo 2 that was just published. And they really break down granularly what happened to these women. And for nine of the 16 cases, I'm thinking off the top of my head, so maybe eight, I think it's nine of 16, they finished their PARP, meaning they probably progressed because that's, you treat it till progression and they got AML or MDS. There was no intervening treatment. Three of the cases had intervening treatment and then one I can't remember. So, so that's a little worrisome um, to me, to be honest. And I don't quite know what to do about it yet. Um, I, and, and in, and in solo one, the cases were early, you know, they were 18 to 20 months, you know, on part much earlier than we would expect to see a treatment related myeloid neoplasm for a woman with ovarian cancer. Um, so I think we need a lot more information about like from the flow cytometry, like what exactly are driving these mutations? Are they different in these early ones versus late ones? Um, and, is and there, also, you know, whether or not, you know, continuous use of PARP. Continuous PARP, right. can you stop it? Right. Someone because that's I mean, a complete I know, response. I know so on, and obviously you can speak to this, but people could could or could not stay on, right? So I think that we'll have more data from Solo One as well. Well, right? only only 12% stayed on beyond two years. So the majority stopped at two years. In the recurrent yeah. setting where we think everyone's going to recur again, there's this drive to kind of keep you on something that's working. Right. Right. Exactly. That's the right thing. I don't know. And the, and the Olympia study, which will be presented at ASCO for breast cancer is one year of PARP. So I think that these are the types of studies that we're really going to have to see. And by the way, we don't use much platinum. About 25% of patients in that study had had platinum. So we're going to get to start to tease out prior platinum exposure, length of platinum exposure, length of PARP inhibitor exposure, right. 
to try to get this because, uh, you know, there's a possibility. Could you use PARP for prevention? Well, not if it's going to give you leukemia. So we have to we have to really dig deep and sort these things out. And these types of data will be really, really helpful. So, Kim, tell us about, you know, so pancreatic cancer. I mean, come on, we have an, a, a, a therapy for pancreatic cancer. So tell us tell us about um, that. So there is a um, there was a study uh, published uh, two years ago called uh, Polo, which looked at patients with germline BRCA uh, variations and uh, and metastatic pancreatic cancer who were platinum sensitive. So they had at least four months of platinum chemotherapy and were responding to platinum chemotherapy, or at least had not progressed on that therapy were taken off treatment and were randomized, I believe, in a three to two fashion to get Olaparib as a maintenance therapy versus a placebo. And that trial showed a, a doubling in the progression free survival in the, in the elaborate group. Now the numbers now compared to ovarian cancer, compared to the solo studies, compared to, to data and breast cancer, it's not that it's, it's clearly a, a different bar with pancreas. It's, it's a different disease. Um, but the progression free survival was about eight months in the, um, in the, the treatment arm and about four months in the, in the non-treatment arm. And there was no difference. The final analysis was just presented in January. Uh, and there was no difference in overall survival between the two groups, although it's noted that a fair number crossed over about 19% of people after they knew that they had placebo went on to get a PARP inhibitor off label. So you have to take that into account. Um, but it did lead to the FDA approval for, for PARP. And, and what's, and what's interesting people, you know, there's a lot of controversy around that study because, because there was no survival difference and it was not powered for survival, but there was a, no survival difference. And, um, and some argue, well, we had a hazard ratio of 0.54 between the groups. In other words, the patients who had the PARP did a lot better um, and we should be using it. But what I think is actually much more important um, about this study is, is how different, how, how we see that there are clearly different groups of people, even within just the small genomic subset. So there were people in, in Polo who did not, who didn't respond at all where you almost wonder if they, if their pancreas cancer was related to their tumor. You don't know, we don't know, we don't know that information yet, um, but who after very brief PARP therapy progressed, their tumor started to grow again. There's a group that did well for, for maybe six months to two years. And then there's this hyper responder group that was doing well for three years, four years, five years, six years, whatever. Um, and then we published uh, on Monday, a study in JCO looking at rucaparib in, in pancreas cancer. We expanded the population a little bit, included somatic and included PALB2 carriers um, and looked at a slightly different, a different population. And again, saw activity, bottom line, there's activity. So I think the bottom line is that there's an option now to get away from, from chemotherapy after a certain point. For, for most of pancreas cancer patients with incurable disease, unfortunately, the only you know, the NCSAN driven guideline driven therapy is, is perpetual chemo in some form. And that's a really unacceptable option um, for people who, who have durable responses because the quality of life and organ function and all those kinds of things start to go down quite drastically. If you're on chemotherapy for, for years, it's just not designed to be used that way. Um, so that's, I think, a very important place. You know, we need to learn who and, 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 and what can we do better than just PARP? Clearly eight months is a low, you know, that's not the bar we want to hit. That's the first step. And then we want to go forward. Um, and we will be looking just like Susan just mentioned, Olympia, which will be at ASCO with looking at breast cancer with BRCA um, and looking at a year of, of Olaparib. We will be doing the same in a study for pancreatic cancer called Apollo, an ECOG acronym study um, that will examine a year of PARP inhibitor for patients with BRCA or PALB2 related pancreatic cancer who have gotten all their therapy um, to see if we can improve the cure rates because it's um, they're very good. Over 50% of people with pancreas cancer will still recur after we do everything to try to prevent that. So we are surgically resecting the patients. Yeah, sur surgery, chemo, you know, anything. And so we are striving hard. We will get there. We are we're trying to see if we can move those numbers in the right direction, cure more patients. Well, I think you've heard uh, from this panel, you know, we are, we are devoted. You have all three of us on the call. We are determined uh, to do better. You there are a lot of questions we didn't get to as we have done in the past. I will answer them and uh, we'll have little <laughs> video clips. Uh, no, I mean, we do this just to make sure we want to have everyone answer the question. And if I need help, I'll pull some people in. So I, I wanted to first absolutely thank uh, Dr. Rice Binder, uh, Dr. Moore for their incredible participation on the panel. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. John Epstein, who's our Chief Scientific Officer at Penn to uh, close out the session. Again, thank you, Drs. Uh, Moore and Dr. Rice Binder. Thank you, Dr. Domchek, for a, a really great discussion. And 
for your outstanding leadership of the Basser Center uh, and your expertise as a worldwide authority in BRCA-related research and care. Uh, thanks to our panelists, uh, Dr. Kathleen Moore and Dr. Kim uh, Reese Binder, and for your congratulations on the uh, recent clinical trial work that you mentioned just now. I know it's received a lot of uh, celebration in the lay press and in the medical literature uh, as well. Um, as this uh, two-day symposium draws to a close, I want to personally thank Mindy and John Gray for their leadership and their vision and in making international collaboration a major focus of the Basser Center and for their ongoing partnership uh, to see that there's real impact from uh, all the work that's underway. Um, Mindy and John, I also want to extend my personal condolences for the loss of your friend Steve Price uh, to his brother David, uh, who's written and spoken so movingly about him and to Steve's family and his friends. Uh, tragedies like this continue to occur all too frequently. Many of us here uh, know it personally, uh, and they motivate us every day uh, and our mission. Um, but, you know, we also are seeing more and more successes. And uh, I know this personally, since, uh, as you know, I'm a survivor of stage three colon cancer myself. And thanks to the advances in science and medical care, I'm here today to join this terrific uh, symposium. Uh, we can cure cancer. We are curing cancer, and we will cure cancer with your help. Uh, and that help is really invaluable. Uh, Kim Reese Binder, as highlighted on the Conquer Cancer website, is quoted there uh, saying it so well. Uh, the impact of donors is extraordinary. She's quoted as saying, researchers need resources to carry out our work, both the clinical trials and the key science that goes with them. I think that sums it up uh, pretty well. Uh, the vision of Mindy and John Gray to accelerate research, uh, bring new cures uh, to the clinic through international collaboration and philanthropy, you know, a decade ago was way ahead of its time. Uh, but we're seeing now a really rapid compression of the time that it takes to bring new therapies to the clinic. And the pace of scientific advance is accelerating as never before. I think this is exemplified uh, best by the remarkable success of the COVID mRNA vaccines developed here at Penn and highlighted just this morning on the NBC Today show, which uh, featured today Drew Weissman and Katy Carico. The pace of bringing that vaccine that's been so successful, none of us would have predicted. But we're seeing that across the landscape in science in cancer research and elsewhere. Uh, the Grays have rallied a generous community of supporters that's been pivotal to our ability to pursue really great ideas, ideas and trials uh, for treating BRCA-related cancers. And the science that's coming out of this work is informing uh, medical therapies way beyond BRCA-related uh, cancer. So its impact is even greater than uh, one might have expected at first blush. The impact of the Basser Center is rippling far and wide uh, across the world. Um, thanks to Sherry and Len Potter, the Basser Global Prize illuminates the Basser Center's commitment to sharing knowledge widely and for the good of all of humanity. And uh, I just want to comment that the Basser Center, in addition to those we've uh, met this, uh, this morning, uh, has a, a just world-class leadership team, including people like Roger Greenberg, Ronnie Drabkin, Kate Nathanson, each one making impact in their areas of work and also leading outstanding teams uh, themselves. So uh, congratulations to all of the leadership uh, team. Thank you, Mindy and John. Thanks to all of you in the audience for your great questions today, for your support, uh, and for joining us. And if you want to know more about what's going on at the Basser Center, get more involved, please reach out to us. Uh, I know that uh, everyone involved will be happy to engage uh, with you and to provide more information. So I'll turn it back to you, uh, uh, Dr. Domjek, and thanks again to everybody.
But just a really uh, quick comment. Thank you so much, Dr. Epstein. Uh, thanks again to our panelists. And uh, we'll, if, please, uh, we're closing out the whole symposium now. Please put in your evaluations. Again, we will get to your questions. Thank you so much for submitting them. And we'll see you again May 10th and 11th of next year, hopefully in person. Thanks, everybody.